the cult was never banned, really. I think that's part of the thing. We never lived up to our full potential because the time that we had our best lineup, the drummer was taking was taking heroin, and unfortunately, we had to get him kick him out of the band. And that was to me was the best chemical lineup we had. That was Nigel Preston, and he was my, he was always my favourite drummer. And um, after that, we just couldn't find anybody to, to come close to him. So we just basically kept it going and going and going and going. It was basically me and Billy all the way. The first big hit was in 1985 with the guitar-heavy She Sells Sanctuary, which laid the foundations for the Love album later that year. That was one of the most exciting periods of my life. That was amazing. I was a 23-year-old kid. I was in, like, in Vogue magazine. I was, I was being like, you know, dragged around by the most beautiful women in the world. It was just an amazing time. It was phenomenal. All of a sudden, I'd gone from a place where I felt like really I had a very low self-esteem and I was pet, you know, catapulted and put on a stage and adored and I couldn't put the two things together. So it was like a, it was like a dream world for me. So a lot of the things that I wrote had a lot more metaphor and I made it much more romantic and larger than life and it was sort of like fantasy and I used to write all these songs that were very elaborate in terms of the, you know, the, the, uh, the floweriness of the lyric and it was much more sort of like... You know, I wasn't dealing with real life in a way. I mean, I was, I mean, in my daily life I was, but I spent a lot of my time being drunk and stuff. The later recordings were far removed from the direction that Ian Asprey wanted to follow, so he remembers the Love Album with fondness. Musically, I think, it was much more accomplished. It was much more sincere and real and organic, and, I mean, it was much more... There was no consideration about commerciality whatsoever. I mean, we just did what we did and that was it. I think the politics started to come in a little bit after that. You know, the next album, we were gonna call the second album Peace. You know, I know we wanted to make it more, a bit more guitar orientated and stuff, because I really wanted to make the quintessential English guitar orientated record. And we could never quite get it right. I always felt that in the cult, that we'd severed that relationship with home and that people had this idea that we would, or at least I was like, just gonzoid American rock idiot, which was quite hurtful actually, you know. Yeah. Billy thought otherwise, really. He was more sort of like into riff oriented rock stuff, hard rock. And I really loved working with Billy and I really wanted to stay working with him and stuff, so. So I kind of like compromised a lot more than I should have done, really. And um, the last cult album, I think, sounded a little bit closer to it, but didn't go all the way. Musical differences between Asprey and partner Billy Duffy prompted the cult to split, and the freedom of his brand new project has revitalised his approach to making music. I think the most important thing I've learned definitely is about truth and honesty, being truthful to yourself. No matter what the, uh, the pressure is on the outside to maintain success and stuff, you always have to listen to your inner voice and just go with it. I mean, I've started out very, very humble at the beginnings, had great success, and then sort of like petered out, you know. And uh, I've been through the whole cycle. And for me, it's just, it's really about you. If you're happy with your songs and you're happy with the music you're playing, then that's, that's the bottom line. Because that's what you have to live with every day, the quality of what you do. If you're not happy with the quality of what you do, then it's going to either destroy you or, you know, it's going to make you a very, very unhappy person.